Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Maria Camara Torres will defend the academic thesis Tracing Fast Roads Towards Bone Generation Strategies to Augment the Bioactivity of Additive Manufactured Scaffolds. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis in about 15 minutes. Thank you, um, dear Prorector, members of the committee, family and friends. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a glimpse of the work that I have performed during my PhD on strategies to augment the bioactivity of additive manufactured scaffolds for bone regeneration applications. Bones are the scaffolds that enable us to perform our daily activities. However, they are also one of the mostly damaged tissues in our bodies. Bone defects can happen due to fractures, tumor resections, bone infections or implant associated fractures. In an ideal scenario, these defects are small and the bone can heal on its own. However, in up to 10% of the cases, these defects are too large, also called non-union defects, and bone will fail to heal. In order, to bone, in order for bone to self-heal, the suitable biomechanical and biological conditions are required. When these are met, bones tend to heal within 12 weeks, However, in non-union defects, further medical interventions are required because these conditions are not met. Current clinical strategies to deal with non-union defects are based on autografts, allografts, the mineral bone matrices, and bone morphogenetic proteins injections. However, they all possess a series of disadvantages such as donor site morbidity, limited availability, lack of structural properties, high costs or the need of revision surgery. So what would be an alternative for treating non-union defects? In the last years, additive manufacturing and in particular melt extrusion additive manufacturing has stood up as a technique ideal to fabricate scaffolds, which are structures that can be implanted into the non-union defect to support bone regeneration. And these are ideal because they can be printed into complex shapes fitting the defect of the patient. And they are highly macroporous, which facilitates bone ingrowth into the scaffold. However, um, these scaffolds are fabricated with synthetic polymers, such as PHPVT that we used in this thesis, which lack the bioactivity to trigger a cell response towards bone regeneration. That's why within this thesis, we investigated the addition of several nanoparticles to render the scaffolds uh, more bioactive and stimulate cell behavior. In chapter five, we incorporated hydroxyapatite to mimic the bone composition. In chapter six, reduced graphene oxide to give electrical properties to the scaffold. And in chapter seven, fillers carrying antibiotics to locally prevent infections. In order to test the performance of these scaffolds, we perform uh, cell culture experiments in the lab. And the first step towards this experiment is cell seeding of the scaffolds. However, if you remember from previous slides, I told you that these scaffolds are highly macroporous, which makes difficult the seeding process. That's why in the first two chapters of the thesis, we investigated two different strategies to improve cell attachment and seeding efficiency to the scaffolds. The conventional method to see 3D printed scaffolds consists on placing a droplet of cell suspension on, on top of its surface. However, due to gravity, cells tend to sediment to the bottom. For this reason, within this chapter, we developed a simple and reliable method in which we fight the gravity force by increasing the viscosity or the density of the cell seeding medium. In this way, letting, float, letting cells uh, float in suspension, allowing them more time to attach to the scaffold filaments. As you can see in these images with these two new strategies, we attained higher 
cell attachment and homogeneous distribution along the scaffold, which improved testosterone matrix production and accelerated osteogenic differentiation of cells culture in the scaffold. In the next chapter, we investigated the different strategy to tackle the problem of cell attachment, which was based on plasma treatment of the scaffold. Conventional plasma functionalization of a scaffold is a, um, is a multi-step process, not efficient, and leads to inhomogeneous treatments. That's why here we investigated the use of a hybrid platform in which we could fabricate and treat the scaffold within the same device, which improved the um, efficiency of the treatment, the homogeneity, and also speeded up the process. And in particular, we investigated what was the effect of a negatively charged and positively charged functionalization of the scaffold on cell attachment. As you can see in these images, plasma functionalized scaffolds led to higher cell attachment through protein uh, mediation. And we also observed, interestingly, that in the negatively charged functionalized scaffolds, cells also were able to adhere, this, in this case, through electrostatic interactions without the presence of proteins in the serum uh, of the cell culture medium, which we believe has potential for clinical translation. Once that we investigated how to improve the seeding efficiency on our scaffolds, we moved forward to investigate the addition of different nanoparticles. The, per the first one was hydroxyapatite, because up to 7% of the human bone is composed of this, of a modified form of hydroxyapatite. When we mix a soft polymer with a stiff but brittle hydroxyapatite, we end up with a composite material with the good mechanical properties for applying it for bone regeneration applications. And in addition, hydroxyapatite as other calcium phosphates can release calcium and phosphate ions to the surroundings, which can influence cell behavior towards osteogenesis. In this chapter, we moved, we went up to 45% loading of hydroxyapatite, reaching the mechanical properties of cancellous bone. However, we found out that the ion exchange dynamics with the medium was not efficient, which led to no influence of hydroxyapatite in the osteogenic differentiation of cells culture in our scaffolds, in our in vitro experiments. However, we believe that this calcium phosphate reprecipitation on the surface of the filaments has a lot of potential um, for the in vivo application of these scaffolds. In the next chapter, we investigated the addition of reduced graphene oxide. Why? Because bone is a piezoelectric material, which means that upon mechanical stimulation, electrical signals are generated. And reduced graphene oxide, can, which is electrically conductive, can help us to render the scaffold conductive. In addition, reduced graphene oxide is, is thermally stable, but it has a disadvantage, and it's that it has a very low bulk density, and it makes it hard and difficult to mix it with polymers, and it can also be uh, hazardous, hazardous during inhalation. For this reason, we previously densified the RGO before mixing it with polymer and fabricating scaffolds with it. As we expected, we obtained scaffolds with electrical conductivity. We also observed that such scaffolds had antimicrobial activity, and still cells were able to grow on the scaffolds even at high loadings of RGO. Also interestingly, we found out that the densification parameters and the concentration of RGO within the scaffold had a a strong effect on the printability of such material, which is something important to take into account for the further application of the, of the scaffolds. In the last chapter, we investigated the addition of antibiotics to our scaffolds. Because of the high rate of bone infections on open bone fracture scenarios, the current strategies to deal with bone infections such as systemic administration of antibiotics or cements impregnated with antibiotics are not efficient due to lack of biodegradability, lack of mechanical stability, or little control over, over drug release. 
The first thought would be to directly add the antibiotics to our scaffold, but this, sorry, but this would lead to burst release of the antibiotics, which is not ideal. And also antibiotics are not thermally stable and they wouldn't resist the temperature of the printing process. That's why we incorporated them within this lamellar inorganic fillers, which can act as thermal shield, as well as as a mechanism to, uh, to obtain a control, a sustained release of the antibiotics into the surroundings. With these complexes, we mix uh, together with the polymer, we fabricated the scaffolds, expecting them to act as local delivery system of antibiotics. We had two different systems, one with the antibiotic gentamicin and ciprofloxacin, and we tested the performance of this scaffold against two bacterial strains that are common in the orthopedics field. We observed that scaffolds both containing gentamicin and ciprofloxacin intercalating in our, intercalated in our fillers showed antimicrobial activity, as well as didn't hinder the osteogenic differentiation and cell growth of cells culture on our scaffolds. As a conclusion, I hope that I could show you a bit of what kind of strategies we followed in this PhD thesis to augment the bioactivity of melt extruded additive manufactured scaffolds. In the first two chapters, we investigated two methods to improve the seeding efficiency and attachment. In the following chapter, we investigated how hydroxyapatite can increase the mechanical properties of the scaffold, how reduced graphene oxide can give electrical properties and antimicrobial properties as well, and how the intercalation of antibiotics within lamellar fillers can lead to a um, local delivery system of antibiotics within the bond effect. With this, I, want, I would like to acknowledge of the people that contributed to this work, specifically my supervisors, the, um, my colleagues from the biofabrication group in Maryland, and the project partners that also contributed. And now I would like to give the word back to the project. Thank you very much for this very interesting and clear presentation. Even the pro-rector seems to understand what's in your nice book. Um, we continue with the degree committee. And for those who are not aware of these procedures, all the members of the degree committee have been a uh, member of the assessment committee as well. So uh, they have read the book, they have read all the chapters, and they had months to find out very interesting questions to ask today. And I will open the opposition uh, with uh, Professor Jonas Papantonio, who is a professor at the Catholic University in Leuven and who is an expert in tissue engineering. Professor Papantonio. Thank you for the kind introduction, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so I will proceed with the first question. Um, yeah. Uh, the first methodology that you showed was how to enhance the seeding efficiency by making a solution that is more viscous. And you demonstrated in your first, let's say, experimental chapter uh, that this indeed worked. My question was, why did it work? What is the mechanism that allowed to see, you know, the outcome that you saw? So what happened to the cells and they were able to... Uh, have a higher efficiency in seeding? What was the underlying mechanism, according to your experience? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. So as I mentioned in the presentation, why he wanted to fight the gravitational force, um, because we believe that this one together with the macroporosity of our scaffolds are responsible for uh, low cell seeding efficiency and poor attachment across the scaffold. And if we look into um, fluid dynamics uh, formulas, uh, we come up with a formula in which the cell sedimentation velocity, let's call it like, call it like that, is related to the gravitational force 
um, the viscosity of the medium in which uh, our cells that are in this case considered spheres are, as well as the density of this medium. And with this formula in mind, we decided to increase the viscosity in order to reduce the cell set settling velocity as much as possible, as well as to um, match the density of the cell settling medium to the density of the cells in order to bring the settling, settling velocity to zero. So we follow this approach, taking into account the, this law of physics of fluid dynamics. And in this way, we were able to, um, by increasing the viscosity to reduce as much as possible this settling velocity. And as I said, with um, increasing the density of the medium, bring it almost to zero in order to leave the f cells floating into the cell seeding medium during the seeding period, allowing them to attach to the scaffold filaments. We also observed that, uh, and we believed that not all the cells are able to attach to the scaffold, even in these conditions, because the cells that are in the, let's say, in the center of the pores, which have uh, the pores are around 500 micrometers. The pores that the, the cells that are in the center and that they don't find any attachment point, they will just not attach and be washed away. But there is a high percentage of the cells that, since the beginning, they are close to the scaffold filaments, and they can easily find attachment point when they are floating without gravity acting as a dragging force towards the bottom. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my second question is going to the nano-hydroxyapatite coating of the scaffolds and that work that you presented on this front. And I wanted to ask you um, on whether, you know, the coating that you developed um, induced mineralization of extracellular matrix uh, from the cells during their osteogenic differentiation and whether you investigated this and whether this mineralization of the ECM could also be, let's say, active far away from the scaffold surface. So in the new tissue that is formed during, the, let's say, the induction of uh, your osteogenic differentiation. W what is your, let's say again, your, your feeling, your experience during the experimental procedures on this front and what did you see? So could you make a fully mineralized tissue in vitro, do you think, uh, by developing this type of uh, novel biomaterial, let's say? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question properly because you mentioned a coating. Um... Yeah, so, so you had your polymer with the nanohydroxyapatite, right? So we don't have a coating. The nanohydroxyapatite is... Um, integrated within the polymer matrix. So yes, it's yes. not a code. Okay, yeah. uh -huh. Correct. And your question was that if the mineralization was observed on top of the filaments or overall the extracellular matrix? Yeah. yeah. So in the case of the scaffolds that were cultured in mineralization medium, um, the extracellular matrix was um, mineralized. So there were calcium and phosphate deposits, mineral deposits on the extracellular matrix that is also formed within the pores of the scaffolds, not only on top of the filaments. But in the case of the scaffolds that were cultured in basic medium without the addition of osteogenic factors, we observed that this mineralization was mostly on top of the filaments for several reasons. One, because not a very dense extracellular matrix was formed within the pores. It was mostly within the, on top of the filaments. And also it's possible that um, 
The majority of this calcium phosphate deposition that we observed is not due to extracellular matrix being mineralized by cells, but just by the calcium phosphate uh, reprecipitation on the surface of the filaments. And this, I think, is mostly the case because we didn't observe any osteogenic um, upregulation of uh, significant upregulation of genes or proteins that should have happened before mineralization. So we believe that this layer is mainly covering the scaffold filaments because of calcium phosphate reprecipitation, not because oh. the action of cells. Thank you very much for the response to this question. So you mentioned in your introduction that the target uh, you know, of developing this novel um, uh, scaffolds and methods to, to enhance the properties of the scaffolds are targeting uh, non-union defects. Um, so going towards, let's say, questions in a preclinical or clinical context, uh, uh, you know, the, what you investigated was millimeter size uh, um, modules, let's say, of, of scaffolds with cells, etc. cetera. Um, how can you see, let's say, the adoption of other technologies towards um, increasing the scale of your uh, implants that, or your envisaged implants, let's say, in the future? So how would you allow uh, development of clinically relevant uh, implants? Mm. You know, you have mass transport limitations, etc. Eventually, yeah. So, um, although our scaffolds are highly porous, um, we still believe that there would be a limitation of nutrients and oxygen because of the size of the scaffold uh, when it's applied in a clinical scenario or mm -hmm. to an animal because our scaffolds for performing in vitro experiments are rather small. And then there we see that cells are able to, to survive even when they are cultured in static conditions, but in a clinical setting, such scaffolds would be, would be larger. And what I mentioned in the, somewhere in my thesis in the conclusions, um, is that we believe it's important to add some factors in order to trigger vascularization from the beginning of the, of the implantation within our scaffolds. Because in order for bone to form, vascularization is crucial. If we have a, um, an environment, an hypoxic environment, um, bone will not form um, as such environment. Well, now that I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking that um, although having an epoxic environment, it's possible that at the beginning, a cartilage like a tissue is formed because of lack of um, blood vessels, for example. But I wouldn't see that as a problem since we, we know that from embryogenesis and from normal fracture healing that cartilage is the precursor of um, hypertrophic bone and bone. So we would have to perform the experiments to um, in vivo to see if this is the pathway that cells would follow within our scaffolds if they would go first towards cartilage formation because of the la lack of vascularization or not. And we would have to implement in our scaffold um, some other cues in order to promote the vascularization from the beginning towards bone formation from the first stage. Okay, thank you very thank much you for very, the thank you very much. discussion. And thank you very much. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Professor Papantonio for your opposition, and then the opposition will be continued by Professor Sander Leeuwenburg, who is a professor at the Radboud University in Nijmegen at the Department of Dentists. So for those of you thinking about bones, dentists are also very important for that aspect. Professor Leeuwenburg. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rector. In this case, I, I'm a material scientist. I will pretend I, I'm a dentist. So for the, for the next nine minutes. Um, but uh, dear candidates, my uh, compliments for you and for your team of supervisors uh, for the completion of your thesis. I've read it with uh, great interest, and I particularly liked uh, the versatility of your approach. You followed various different approaches towards upgrading the, the bioactivity of your scaffolds. But at a certain point while reading your thesis, I was also wondering if it was not too versatile because you focus on cell seeding and plasma treatment and incorporation of various types of particles, which is a very broad stretch. So I'd like to start with a very general question, like if you would now start all over again or continue, are there any approaches or chapters that you would absolutely continue with or maybe absolutely uh, abort? Yeah? So. Were there any approaches that you did not like at all, or is there any preference at this stage? Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and your kind words. Um, this is not an easy question to reply, but uh, I would say that, yes, I would do things differently now that I have the overall picture of my thesis. Something that I wouldn't change is uh, the first chapters in which um, we try to um, develop a strategies for increasing the cell seeing efficiency because this is a problem that is very common in the field. And I believe that if we hadn't uh, solved this at the beginning, um, we wouldn't have got the results that we got. And I think that it's also a way to uh, help others, to other groups, to further investigate on such scaffolds. Um, something that I would change, for example, is, well, I wouldn't say that I would change. It was interesting to know, is that uh, the hydroxyapatite chapter was very interesting to me because there has been so much work being done on hydroxyapatite um, three printed scaffolds in combination with polymers that, and let's say almost all of these um, literature studies report how great it is to incorporate hydroxyapatite within polymers. And I discovered that maybe it's not that great, but I have to say, and as I also discussed in my thesis, that I might have seen these results because of the high a cell attachment to my scaffolds that was had that's sorry that had been never attained i would say mm -hmm. uh, so i'm glad you select so, uh, i'm glad you select this this hydroxyapatite because that was one of the chapters i also thought very interesting but and i think it leaves some room for improvement so i i suggest we have a discussion in more detail on that uh, chapter um so what i noticed that is you, you introduced quite a large amount of hydroxyapatite, which sounds great in detail, and we all know that it's supposed to uh, stimulate osteogenic differentiation. But when I looked at your pictures, I noticed that the nanoparticles agglomerate to a large extent, which is logical if you introduce a hydrophilic filler into a hydrophobic matrix. Um, have you considered to, to follow a, a modification method to, to improve the dispersion of your particles, uh, such as reported previously also, like the, there have been approaches where um, the, the hydroxyapatite has been surface modified. Has that been uh, considered in your work or you hoped it would work in this way either? Mm, I wouldn't think that that would have had a high influence on my results. Because it's still being aggregated or not, I believe that um, polymer would uh, cover the hydroxyapatite on the surface still to a large extent. And still, we wouldn't be able to see that much effect of hydroxyapatite, let's say. Okay, so I wouldn't, 
And yeah. I, well, I, I would agree with you, for example, lack of osteogenic differentiation uh, that, that you observed, but, but I also observed that your mechanical properties they improved somewhat, huh? but not, not so much, actually, to be honest. Uh, could that have been improved by uh, increasing the affinity between the particles and your polymer, for example, uh, such as has been defaulted yeah. in the 90s for this polymer? Yeah, uh, sorry, I was thinking only on the cell side, mm -hmm. but I also agree that uh, good nanoparticle dispersion within polymer would lead to much higher mechanical properties than what we observe now. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but also the printing process would be more reliable, let's say, because mm -hmm. at, at, we also observe that uh, at these high loadings, um, um, it's possible that because of particle aggregation, some of the filaments don't have uh, the shape, a good shape uh, as we would like to, because of uh, variations in polymer in composite flow uh, during the extrusion. Mm -hmm. So in this regard, yes, it would be beneficial to investigate um, the modification of the nanoparticles. So I'm asking this also because the values you report uh, regarding st stiffness, for example, your elastic modulus. I understood they are in the range of uh, 90 megapascal, uh, which you suggest is similar to, to bone, to cortical bone. But, but if I read some reports on cortical bone, it goes up to uh, gigapascals. So that's orders of yeah, magnitude I think that there, higher. I think that there's a typo somewhere in the thesis. And I didn't want never to refer to cortical bone because I know that the mechanical properties are, are much higher. I want to refer all the time to cancellous bone. Oh, okay, yeah, but, but even for cancellous bone, the difference is somewhat higher. So I hope that with, I, I could imagine with such interfacial bonding improvement that you could reach those uh, mechanical properties. Because that's, I think, your goal eh, in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in the low... Um, in the low end of the range, range but... Let's, let's see if we can improve. So there is room for improvement. And I think it's logical for such a porous implant that you have, but, but I could imagine with improved uh, bonding between the filler and the matrix, it improves. So uh, one other aspect of the incorporation of these particles was quite interesting, eh? like you observed that the cells did not really become osteogenic, which we all hoped for, of course, and which has been reported previously. And you indicated it's an in vitro effect, so that it's probably caused by deposition of calcium phosphate onto the polymer, and therefore lower calcium and phosphate uh, concentrations. But before, uh, in, the, in the 90s, Kokubo proposed that uh, the formation of such a layer is basically predictive for bone bonding. Eh? And well, that has been question, questions afterwards by people like Boner and so on. But do you now propose that uh, such layer is actually uh, predicting the opposite, so that if you have formation of such a calcium phosphate layer on your polymer, that that could then impede osteogenic differentiation, at least in vitro. Um, so I also mentioned that this calcium phosphate layer in an in vivo situation would be beneficial. Um, I mentioned that in the within the thesis. Um, for bone bonding, but at the same time, it, um, as there is more precipitation than um, release of ions, the effect that uh, hydroxyapatite would have on osteogenic differentiation, we wouldn't see it uh, in that way. So on one side, I say that um, the way that the scaffold is uh, fabricated at the moment, it wouldn't um, trigger any cell response, any calcium pathways. But the fact that there is a calcium phosphate uh, layer representation on the scaffold filaments, that I acknowledge that it would have a positive effect in vivo. Okay, so there would be a difference between in vitro and in vivo conditions. In vitro. Yes. Okay, I think that, that really makes so, sense. Okay. It's um, also 
I think so, we, we can stop the opposition okay. by Professor Levenberg here because there are very interesting questions to be followed by other members of the committee. And I would okay. like to continue with this opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Levenberg, uh, with Professor Habibovic, who is an expert in instructive biomaterials and works at the Merlin Institute in Maastricht. Thank you, Mr. Prorector, dear candidate. Also, I have uh, read your thesis with great pleasure. I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team on uh, finalizing it. Um, I, I was I was actually thinking to start differently, but now uh, after this discussion and having had a bit more than a few months of time, as Prorector said, I would like to start still with one of the propositions you have uh, given. And normally uh, one of your findings does that. I don't know how that is with the new rules concerning COVID or if, if that is still possible. I think you can read your proposition self or you can let him do it, what you want. Please go ahead. They have a role. Uh, number six, please. Happy cells are the starting point to happy biomedical research. Thank you very much. So, I was I was intrigued by this. I can I can imagine something about happy, cells being happy, uh, but I I have no idea what we, what you could mean by, uh, with a happy biomedical research. So can you comment on that? And dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and your kind words to my thesis. Um, with happy biomedical research, I mainly talk about happy PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, during um, my PhD, I was working with uh, human mesenchymal stromal cells since the beginning. And I could realize that it's not very easy to work with these cells um, because they, are, they come from patient, uh, depending on who is the donor, they will have a different behavior. They will uh, lead to uh, osteogenesis in vitro earlier or later. Um, you have to take care that they don't get overconfluent because this can have an effect in, in, in your experiments in the long term. So I think that um, being able to work uh, with cells and understand in which conditions they should be grown in order to perform appropriately is very important. And when this is not done correctly, it can lead to misleading results as well as to unhappy PhD students. I see. Okay, so it is all about a happy PhD student. And if I understand correctly, the happiness of a PhD student depends on the quality of the results, which I think is the way it should be, right? So if I would put a, a proposition against this one, well, not, not necessarily against, in addition to this one, I would say um, inorganic uh, materials are the starting point to happy biomedical research. So can you, what, what do you think about my proposition? Yeah, it could be an alternative to mine. Um... Okay, let's put it differently. So uh, what I thought you had in total uh, five chapters, experimental chapters out of three. So the majority you used in inorganic biomaterial and you, you really selected from, from a diversity of them for various reasons, because what you say is that the one gives it electrical properties, the other one uh, gives should give an osteogenic uh, properties, one is antibiotic as a carrier. So I would say that is something that is very valuable. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, mm, specifically in the in this field of one regeneration, um, mainly because one of the main components of bonus I had said is in, uh, an inorganic component. Mm -hmm. So we as teaching engineers are always trying to replicate as much as possible what we see in in our bodies. So we find interesting to implement inorganic materials within our uh, scaffolds. Okay, I, I'll come back to the point of, uh, of biomimetism or, or trying to, to create something that looks like bone just in a moment. But 
while I, I also completely agree with you that, that, that uh, inorganic biomaterials are what, what should make everybody happy, I also realized that actually these inorganic biomaterials cause, you kind of blame them for many things that did not work well. So either they were not, they made the polymer non-printable or, or it was very difficult to handle it or they were not good for cells and so on. So you were blaming them for, for a couple of on unhappy days in your PhD. But what I was surprised about is why did you so much focus on those inorganic materials, uh, but you never looked into the counterparts. So you never tried to change the polymer. I would say that's the, the one to blame. Yeah, I was going to say that, in fact, the polymer has more to be blamed than the filler. And I also <laughs> mentioned that in the thesis, I think in... More than one chapter, I mentioned that if we would change the polymer, for example, to be the, um, degraded faster, uh, we would have an effect that we don't see now, and it's what we are looking for. So I also uh, suggest that future work should be performed um, using a faster degradable polymer, of course, taking into account uh, other factors like the printability or that at the same time we don't want it to degrade uh, so fast that then it's not mechanically stable in in an in vivo situation. So at the end is a balance of everything. So everybody has uh, its part of fault there and we have to find a balance. Yeah, mm. I see, yeah. I think I have one more minute, about one or two. Yeah, so, so just going back to, the, to your comment on, uh, especially on biomimetism and then in particular uh, calcium phosphate and polymer, right? So this is a logical one. The other ones I would say, well, you're, you're mimicking certain properties, not so much the composition, but if you really look into what you have developed, to which extent is that really biomimetic of what we find in natural bone? and. And importantly more, uh, do you think it is really important to mimic the properties of bone in order to get a, a, a clinical outcome that you are uh, looking for? Mm, not necessarily, because we have also seen in literature in some studies that just by the addition of cells without any scaffold, uh, we can also um, close a uh, large defect, let's say. So, yeah, we always have in mind to mimic what we have there, mm -hmm. but it might not be as important. But hydroxyapatite, um, the addition of hydroxyapatite is not only because we want to mimic uh, that hydroxyapatite is in the bone, but because of the effect that it has on cells and our aim because we know that the calcium and phosphate can trigger uh, some calcium signaling pathways and that can lead to the dif osteogenic differentiation. Yeah. So I think it's more into that and also because we can increase the mechanical properties of the scaffold that we can also increase them with other materials, for example, RGO, but there we could argue that RGO might not be biocompatible but we know that hydroxyapatite is because it's already in the bone. Yeah. So um, it's a mixture of everything. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorect. I'm uh, satisfied with the answers. Thank you very much. And then we will continue the opposition by Professor Puse, who is a surgeon at the Department of Surgery at the University of Maastricht. Thank you very much, Prorector. Dear candidate, first of all, of, of course, I would like to congratulate you on your manuscript. This thesis is an achievement made in a highly technological environment in which you thrived well, judging to the amount of work you presented uh, here. Of course, I would like to extend my uh, congratulations to your promoter team. I would like to discuss your thesis further by drawing your attention to the first figure in your thesis, a few, as a trauma surgeon actually, I'm very familiar with. Indeed, bone defects in the size treated in the picture are on the limit of what the treating team can help the patient with, and we are urgently needing solutions for these patients. 
in your thesis, you describe the physio physiochemical properties of the melt extrusion composite scaffolds with efficient cell attachment and osteogenic capacity. The size of your scaffold you use is actually four by uh, di millimeter in diameter and four millimeter in height. So my question again, and Professor uh, Papantonio also addressed that uh, to you is about the scalability of your product. What in your opinion is needed for you to design such an augmented composite scaffold in sizes of let's say five centimeters or more? Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and your kind words. Um, in terms of um, the manufacturing process is not the problem, the scalability. Um, so I would say you would like, uh, you are referring more to um, that maybe in such a higher scale, we would not have uh, access of nutrients to the core of the scaffold or something yeah, like that? Yeah, for example, so you addressed actually in your introduction about vascularity, mm -hmm. but I did not see it in the rest of your thesis. And of course, I, I know there are some compounds which are is able to improve this vascularity. But well, I was a little bit puzzled by your discussion with the previous uh, uh, um, opponent about the hypoxic medium, uh, milieu is, is actually beneficial. So should I aim for a hypoxic milieu in my patient or not then? Mm, this is a very interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if I have the answer to that because I think the only way to know is to perform in vivo experiments mm -hmm. uh, and we perform them, but very, uh, they were only lasting three months. Um, it was in, an in, vivo, in a rat, rabbit model. So in that time, we didn't have time to investigate that far, um, whether our cells were tending more towards chondrogenesis or towards osteogenesis or what was uh, really happening there. So... Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer this question, but I agree that the, um, the scalability in the sense of using uh, large scaffolds or large um, or implant large amount of cells is uh, still an issue that everybody is investigating. So um, we would have to wait for the next results of the next in vivo experiment of somebody. Okay, so so you print a, you say it's not the problem to print a big scaffold, of course not, uh, but the vascularity, I'm not sure what to do about that. Uh, is it the problem on the outside of the scaffold or on the inside of the scaffold, the vascularity? Mm, I would say on the inside. On the inside. Uh, so, on the inside, but uh, on the core, and also on the center in height of the scaffold, because the edges would be still in contact with the with the bone, with the end of the fracture. So we would have as an stimuli there, as well as um, we would have the stimuli of the periosteum. Um, mm -hmm. So so it's all around, on the outside, but not in the center. Yes. So would it be an idea not to print a five centimeter scaffold, but the smaller scaffolds as you used already, and to put a lot of them into the bone defect? Mm, I'm not sure how that would solve the problem because we would just, uh, we would still have some of these smaller scaffolds in the center and so mm. scaling it down it won't work i i suppose from your answer i don't think it would make no. a difference so so we need different approach yeah we could also um 
fabricate a hollow scaffold, but this is also something that it's being done when uh, other groups are performing in vivo experiments. Uh, we see in a lot of cases that the scaffolds are hollow, so they have a, they don't have a polymer or anything in the center, and that might help for cells from the end of the fracture to reach uh, easier okay, to okay. that center. So, so, so you're uh, pointing me to the right direction, so not making a, a, a vast uh, material, but more hollow in the inside or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, so if I may, I, I would like to go to another uh, subject, in, which is very important in bone healing and ex actually mechanical loading. So, mechanical loading is, of course, known to, to stimulate the osteogenic environment. You did not do that in your experiment, but what? So, what should I do for my patient uh, uh, to have the best optimal outcome if I use a scaffold such as yours? Um, should I load the patient mechanically or not? Um, there have also been some studies uh, in animals investigating uh, this, although not using a scaffold materials like we used. And um, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, at the beginning of the implantation, it's important to keep the fracture stable. But after a period of time, um, uh, micromechanical loading was found to be beneficial for bone formation. Mm -hmm. So, and, and can you optimize your scaffold for me mechanical sensing for, for such a uh, a goal to have a improved osteogenic capacity? Mm, so our scaffolds are um, can be deformed when mechanical uh, force is applied to them. So. I would say that at the beginning of uh, after the implantation, we would have to have some external fixation uh, to avoid um, that the scaffold is compressed. And after some period of time, um, we uh, it would be beneficial the fact that the scaffold is. Um, Mm, can be compressed, is compliant. Mm -hmm. And also we would have to take into account what is the uh, loading that would lead to um, faster bone formation rather to detrimental because, so we would have to adjust the mechanical properties of our scaffold. It's uh, time. I'm satisfied with your uh, answer, and I give the word back to the pro -record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Puzza. And then we continue with the last member of this committee, Prof. Dr. Rosado Balmayor. And she's also from the Merlin Institute and knows everything about instructive biomaterials. Thank you very much, Pro-Rector, for the kind introduction. Uh, to the candidate, I would like to congratulate for your thesis and for the work that has been done, and to the supervisory team, also my congratulations for this work. So if we, if we I would like you to keep uh, thinking about the clinical translation of your scaffolds. Um, if we think about chapter three, you incubate your scaffolds overnight in cell called Chomidian, and this is known to improve cell addition, uh, attachment, eventually even cell proliferation. Now, um, I would like to ask you if you will think about a methodology to implement to scaffolds that are going to be implanted into a patient because we cannot, it's not translational that we can incubate scaffolds in cell culture medium. What would be your methodology to improve uh, integration and cell responses to the scaffolds in the clinic? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so, as I'm um, mentioning chapter four, where I investigated the effect of different plasma functionalizations on, on the scaffold, 
uh, we observed that if the um, when the scaffold is functionalized with negatively charged groups, we don't need um, serum in our medium in order to promote cell attachment because cells already attach to the scaffold uh, through electrostatic interactions. So that would be a way to avoid the use of serum, at least during the seeding. And um, we could directly implant our scaffold right after this uh, without uh, further culture. And in this way, we would be avoiding the use of serum completely. Um, yeah, that is so, what I can think of right now. Yep, that is a very good, that leads me to another question. So you are proposing a treatment that we could implement after the fabrication immediately of your product, right? Yeah. Um, is there any treatment that you can think about to further improve the integration and the biocompatibility that could be done by the surgeon, by the nurse, immediately before implanting your scaffold into a patient? Or would you say that the plasma treatment or surface modification, other of the uh, approaches that you follow during your thesis, or even the composite material use, is sufficient to uh, ensure integration and biocompatibility? Mm. Um, we cannot ensure. Um, we, for example, with this chapter, we we, we didn't um, um, we observed that although cells were attaching, uh, the plasma treatment didn't lead to further effect on cells. But I think that if our goal is to implant a scaffold containing cells, this would be uh, sufficient because then we would rely on the factors that we find in vivo to continue the process. So this would be already a good starting point. And so far of all the methods that are available, this one would be perhaps the most ideal to uh, retain cells on our scaffold before implanting it. Comparing compared to, for example, um, the use of hydrogels as carriers or another surface modification. Very good. And then the very last question, perhaps I give you the um, opportunity to globally look at your thesis and all the approaches that you study and investigated. If I ask you to give me one combination that will provide the best suitable scaffold for a non-union different treatment. What would you answer? Among what I investigated? Right? All your approaches, material composites included. Um, so I, <clears throat> sorry, uh, as I mentioned in the thesis, I think that I, at the end I would uh, choose incorporating hydroxyapatite. Um, because um, it's, we know that hydroxyapatite is biocompatible, unlike uh, reduced graphene oxide, for example, that we are not sure yet about um, whether the amounts that we are incorporating would be in an in vivo situation or not. Also, a lot of research has been done around hydroxyapatite. There are a lot of uh, products that are in the market based on calcium phosphates. And, but of course, I would also like to add further functionality by adding the fillers with antibiotics. Although I know that there is a lot of uh, investigation that has to be done in this field, but this would um, give something extra that so far nobody um, is thinking about uh, if we are talking about 3D printed scaffolds because we already know that there are commercially available cements also biodegradable and non-degradable that contain antibiotics but 
uh, these ones are the assignments. They are not porous. They don't have they don't have the the goal to uh, help for bone to regenerate in the same way that we aim for. So I would combine these two. Very good. Thank you very much for the answers. I think I had one more question, but you are saved by the Beagle. Maria Torres, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw, withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
Maria Torres, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualification, the degree committee has decided to grant you your degree of doctor. Professor Moroni is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I here com hereby confer upon you, Maria Camara Torres, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. That's a big one. Should do it also according to the most present rules. Estimada doctora Camara Torres, dear Maria, what an impressive defense we have had today. Not a surprise, considering how you have been always handling your research from experiments to collaborations, literature research, reflection time, we have seen today quite a bit of reflection time. And finally, writing. It has been an ocean to cross, but with you on the steering wheel, I should say probably at the helm, a joyful navigation to the end line. We met first while uh, you were finishing your master's degree back in Aachen in biomedical engineering at the beginning of 2016, about. I contacted at that time Professor Laura de la Porte, whom I would also like to personally thank, hopefully she's online, not only for her availability in discussing your qualities in detail, but most importantly, for having introduced each other to ask if she knew of a good student for a PhD uh, position that came available in the group. She indicated you, and so we got in touch. It was since the beginning a good match. Your job interview already gave very good indications of uh, some of your traits. Meticulous in your preparation, solid as a rock in your apparent quietness, clearly engaged in your education. The impression was outstanding. I got you got the job, and after five years and a half, yeah, we are here celebrating yet another success in your young career. Your PhD degree, in these years, I've got to know you more and more. A cheerful, yet shy young woman with a strong motivation to excel, a suburb sense, a superb sense of curiosity and intrepid to explore unknown topics. To these qualities, you soon added a friendly character able to lead interactions with several partners in the European project that funded us and to make a true example of team science with Ravi, one of your paranymph, and with Carlos, your co-supervisor. A true example of professionality provided with politeness, respect and care for your colleagues, all qualities that we often underestimate in a friendly environment such as the create, that created in academia, but it is of paramount importance for success. Dear Maria, dear Dr. Camara Torres, it was an incredible journey to work with you. 
the first PhD I co-supervised here at Merlin. I still remember our first two project meetings where we were discussing our initial plans and Maria, as a young child, endlessly with endless thirst of knowledge and endless curiosity, why we have defined the project in such a way. It was countless the times that you, Maria, asked why. After us providing you with an answer, you would return again and again with a why question until you would be satisfied. At start, everything was confusing. Why gradients? Why printing? Why this polymer? Why this and that? At first, it was a real challenge, but this is also the basis of a great scientist that you have become over the years. Maria constantly asked us, and I'm sure she also asked herself why. Why are these results leading to this? Why, why, why? I hope you never lose this inquis inquisitive nature of yours that I have noticed less in the latest years. You can plan and do all the things we envision, but we, all, we will always have more and more questions to think about. With Ravi and later with Philippa, you made an incredible team that I'm extremely proud of. Not only were you able to find a good balance to work with all these people in the Institute, but you also excelled on taking care of work tasks, demonstrating an incredible work uh, that you did during the project, uh, in the project meetings, to the project partners, to the project officer, and to our expert reviewer. It was also impressive the way that you communicated always your achievements to your peers in the multiple tasks and in the multiple participations in international conferences. Maria was incredible on managing every single little detail of her project. When her work depended on external factors, Maria would morph on Sherlock Holmes until all the details of the, the cases would be clear. This was always done eximiously with the support of her colleague Watson, uh, sorry, Ravi. These cases were a good time spending at the lab cracking down those experiments that would not make sense from the start. Maria, congratulations for the great scientist that you have become. I'm proud of you and please never stop asking why. Where students can be excellent in experimental work in the lab, writing could offer more danger and muddy weather at the horizon. Yet, Maria confirmed her maturity also with writing. We have all been in front of different books. Some have good content, but are difficult to digest with too complex wording and concepts. Others combine that good content with a flow that engages the reader without wanting to stop till the end. Maria's first drafts were always punctual and a joy to read, providing that flow comparable to rivers of crystal clear waters moving to the sea. And even when at times those waters would become a little muddy, muddy that is to say, even when critiques would come from co-authors or reviewers, Maria has always taken these in the most constructive manner, combining analytical skills with common sense and pragmatism. You have crowned these efforts today with a splendid defense. And let me take also this moment to thank also all the members of the committee for taking the time to read critically your thesis, in particular, Professor Ioannis Papantoniou and uh, Professor Sander van Leeuwenberg from uh, KU Leuven and Radboud University, respectively, as well as Martijn Pusse from our MUMC Plus for taking time from his clinical practice, and uh, Elisabeth Valmajor and Pamela Bibovic from Merlin uh, for uh, participating and chairing uh, uh, the reading committee, respectively. Quiero extender mis felicitaciones. No, he faltado. Nuestras felicitaciones a tu familia a tus padres, a tu hermana y a tu compañero Mint. El amor y el soporte que te dieron en estos años contribuyeron también a la tan linda persona que eres y a tener momentos de conforto en los días más duros del doctorado. María y las estudiantes que todos los mentores quieren tener el privilegio de guiar. María, we wish you always sunny days in front of you. We know that when clouds will come, you will be well equipped. We hope that our roots will still cross in the future, whether you're swimming in a new professional challenge or in new waters to explore in your adventures, we will always be there for you. It was a great journey.
dear Dr. Torres, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you and your team with the honor you have acquired. We'll come to the end of this session. Uh, there is some organization. Uh, you can leave this room first, uh, but we will make pictures and the Beagle will instruct us where the pictures will be made before we all go to the reception. But the audience here can already go to the reception. And since this meeting is especially about why questions, I would like to ask uh, a why question at the reception and why is happiness a goal of research? And then I close this session.